So I'm running in District 97, uh, which is Duluth, Suwannee, Sugar Hill, and Buford. It's a little part of each of those cities. And um, the district right now has, we have seen so much change over the last 15 years. We've seen an increase of um, Asian Americans moving to this district and so many new people that weren't here 20 years ago. Um, and that's actually when, I, when my family moved here was uh, about 20 years ago. And we've seen how it's changed so much. We've seen the change in our schools and in our businesses um, and in our community. So for the last 25 years, we were representative. Uh, we were represented by Brooks Coleman, who was a strong advocate for public education, um, but now he's retiring. So that leaves an open seat for us here in District 97. How many, uh, how many people, so what, what's the kind of percentage breakdown of, if you look at the ethnic groups? Yeah. So it is still majority white, um, it, but it is over 25% Asian American. So overwhelmingly, um, that Asian American population is made up of Korean voters um, as well as South Asian voters, uh, which is a community that I'm part of. Um, and then the rest of it is it's about 59, 60% white, and then a mix of the other ethnic groups. Uh, most of my viewers are going to look at you and then wonder about your background, right? Yeah. So tell me a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah. So um, my family is from Pakistan. Um, we are Asian American and um, I was born in South Florida and I've lived in Georgia for the last 20 years of my life. Um, and I, you know, we, my family moved here for the American dream, like other families, um, but also to provide better health care for my sister who was born with spina bifida. So, um, you know, wanting to make sure that we had the education and the health care and the opportunities for someone who has a disability. How old are you now? I'm 25. 25, okay. Yeah. And you, you, but you've been around for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm only 25, but I really feel qualified to run for the seat because I've been active in politics for the last couple of years. And really, I've been embedded in the advocacy that it takes to um, represent a district like ours. Uh, I have been an advocate for Asian Americans and actually worked at the Capitol with legislators in both parties to make sure that we're not introducing and we're not passing legislation that impacts our communities in a negative way. Mm -hmm. so if, I, if I had asked you in January, when are you going to run, then what would you have said? Um, I definitely would not have said this year. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I always told people I was going to run eventually, maybe five, ten years down the line. I didn't think it was going to be this year, but I decided to do it this this year because I, I've seen how important it is this year and last year in the past couple of years to have people like us, people that understand the immigrant community, um, represented at the Capitol. And we've seen that over the last two years. We've seen Representative Sam Park and Representative B. Nguyen and how their elections um, help to influence the, you know, the policies and the legislation that we've seen at the Capitol. And so uh, I decided that I couldn't wait <laughs> five, ten five or ten more years and this was the great opportunity to do it. Like I said, I'm 25, I have the time, I have the energy, I have the drive to do it and um, I have a whole community of people supporting me. And, and that, not just because you're uh, uh, on the young side of mm -hmm. the scale of the mm -hmm. politics, what did your uh, family say about your decision? So when I first uh, talked to my parents about it, they thought I was joking. <laughs> um, and then when they asked me, you know, what was it about? Um, what would it entail? You know, uh, my dad wanted to know, would I be the first Pakistani American elected? Which I would be. He asked me if I would be the first Muslim woman elected, which I would be. Um, and he just wanted to know how feasible it was. So I talked him through some of the data and, you know, he's a businessman. So he wanted to know the numbers and the facts and wanted to understand all of that. And once he thought that it was possible, they were all on board and my family's been um, a big, big part of my campaign. Can you kind of relay that, that uh, uh, like a sales pitch to the humane yeah. here and there yeah. about the district? And sure. It has been uh, represented by Republican for mm -hmm. last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you look at the, the numbers for Trump in 2016 from our district, Trump won by by 12 points in 2016 from District 97. And that's different from the rest of Gwinnett County. We all know that Gwinnett County voted for Hillary in 2016, but obviously the northern part of Gwinnett County, where we are, Duluth, Swanee, Sugar Hill, Buford, um, it's not as progressive as the rest of the county. But what we are seeing is the people that have moved to our county, the people that are moving to our communities, haven't really been active in the in the political process before. They became active in 2016 thanks to a lot of nonpartisan and voter engagement efforts, but over the last two years specifically, we've seen that increase. Um, 
we saw an increase in candidates from our communities. Uh, just in the primary, we had David Kim and Ethan Pham running for our congressional seat, and that increased turnout for our communities. But we also saw that more people are starting to get active and also starting to understand why this year is so important for us to get out and vote. We've already seen historic early voting numbers, which is which is very positive and reassuring for someone like me who's running in a very tough district. But what it came down to was, this is an open seat. No Democrat has tried to run in over 10 years. Um, there's a lot of excitement right now with this blue wave, with the Democratic wave, but also it takes out someone that knows the, the community, that knows, pol that knows politics and knows how to run campaigns to win. And I think, um, I think I have all of those things and I'm really excited to be able to run and actually you know, run a campaign that is based on our community, that's based in making sure that we're talking to every member of our community and talking to people in their language. What, what do you think is, is about this election that so many uh, first-time candidates, mm -hmm. so many uh, candidates of who are either first or second mm -hmm. generation uh, immigrants, yeah. so many young candidates, what is it about this year's election? I think people are fed up. They're fed up with seeing the policies that are coming out to get them. They're fed up and not seeing their communities represented. And they're fed up with our politicians who put politics before people. And that's what it was for me. That's what it was for a lot of candidates that I've spoken to. Um, they all understand that you can't just sit there and complain. You can do the advocacy. You can do the work to make sure that communities know what's happening. But at the end of the day, you also need strong advocates in those elected um, positions to make that change happen. Yeah. Isn't the loss of privacy mm -hmm. as a 25-year-old young woman? Yeah. It wasn't, well, did you, did you have, any, <laughs> have any thoughts about, about, about that? Well, I, I've been in the public eye for quite a few years now. Um, all of my work in, the, in my adult life has been in advocacy, in community organizing, community engagement. And so I feel like I've lived a pretty public life already. Um, you know, I do a lot of things uh, where I have to be in front of people, where I have to talk about my personal experience and my family's experience. And at the end of the day, if I can use my personal experience and my story to make a difference, then I think that's worth it. Um, so far, I haven't had anything um, you know, that has really come at me from my past. Uh, no one has tried to attack me on anything. Um, but I also think it's because for a, a race like ours, for a state legislative race, it's it's not as competitive as a congressional race, for example. Um, that's You're really where, TV yeah, I'm not doing TV ads. Um, you know, we are doing everything that it takes to run a, a small local campaign. But at the end of the day, my district is so small and it really comes down to how can you connect with voters? And I've been able to do that by actually talking to people. Um, you know, to this date, we've knocked on almost 11,000 doors, talked to close to 18,000 people at their doors and um, just making sure that we're doing everything it takes to help people understand that this is the year that we can make that difference happen. Uh, there are not only new first-time candidates, but there's a wave of first-time voters, mm -hmm. especially among my readers. Mm -hmm. um, they became plays yeah. a big role in mm -hmm. uh, turning them out for the first time during the summer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And many of the uh, some of the interest and the momentum is being carried on through mm -hmm. the uh, main uh, uh, midterm election. Mm -hmm. And because people can't know enough about each of the candidates they are voting for. Mm -hmm. the party affiliation is going to matter a lot. Yeah. And when you decide to become a Democrat, was it a very natural and obvious choice uh, given your personal experience and also your family background? Um, my family background actually um, wasn't very political. No one in my family has been involved in politics before. Um, I, I tell people all the time that even two years ago, I had to convince my dad to go and vote. And you know, I am the person that was registering voters and talking to people about the elections and in 2016 to get my dad to vote was a huge, um, it was a huge difficult thing for me, right? And so f fast forward two years later, um, my family you know, has become more political and has become more active, but it's actually become um, a response to what's happening with the, with the two parties right now. My dad, my dad and my family have seen what the Republican Party is doing to immigrants, what they're doing to Muslims. Um, and so it's just been, for my family, it's been a response to that. Now for me, um, I have always leaned more progressive. Um, I have worked with a lot of people in the per, uh, Democratic Party before, 
And um, there was no question about it for me. I, there was no way that I could run as a Republican knowing the kinds of policies that they support, knowing the kinds of things that they want to do, um, but also because of my own views. I, I truly believe that we can make um, opportunities for all people, and it doesn't have to be limited to someone's immigration status or their um, sexual orientation or their background. And I want to make sure that I get to uphold those values as a Democratic candidate. I think the Democratic Party of 2018 comes across comes across as a party of inclusion, but at the same time mm -hmm. very ideologically driven. Yep. Uh, yeah. Which is the same for the Republican Party. So in that sense, it's not that different. But then it is different, very different sets of ideologies that drive both parties. Mm -hmm. And because there are a lot of activists, uh, people who are uh, who have the activist background, mm -hmm. uh, they are uh, playing prominent roles in in the parties. Mm -hmm. It. Can seem fairly rigid when you when you look at the when you look at it ideologically, mm -hmm. and and that doesn't does that kind of go against with the the theme of inclusivity because in terms of racial background, sexual orientation, mm -hmm. Democratic Party is very inclusive. Mm -hmm. But when you come when it comes to uh, philosophies, mm -hmm. it can seem fairly exclusive. Yeah. and and I think that kind of uh, rattles some people because who don't see themselves as Republicans because what you know, when they're in power, some of the policies yep. that they're pursuing isn't uh, is against their interests. But then if you look at the Democratic Party, it seems like you are you have to be all the way where the I party understand. is. Otherwise, yeah. they're not going to be welcome. Yeah, and um, I think that's a valid that that is definitely a valid concern. And I have seen that firsthand. I my community was never political, right? We never had a strong political affiliation with any one party. But over the years, um, I think, like I said before, people are driven towards the party that will stand up for them. And this year and the last year, we've seen which party is going to be the one standing up for people, um, for immigrants that are being separated at the border, from immigrants that are being banned at the, at the airports. Um, I think as, as a local candidate, as a statewide election um, for state house, for example, um, for me, you know, we have very strong ideological beliefs as Democrats, but at the end of the day, the kinds of things that we believe in are about families and about how we can make sure that all of our families have opportunities to succeed. And I don't think those are very radical ideas. Um, I don't think that healthcare affordability, affordability is so radical. Um, I don't think that public education is so radical. And so when I talk to voters, when I talk to community members that aren't necessarily Democrat or Republican, we're able to relate more on those basic ideas of what kinds of issues affect your day-to-day -day life and how and which party will work towards uh, making that, that easier for you. So will uh, Democrats work to make uh, healthcare affordable or will Republicans do that? And, and this year we know that it's Democrats that are talking about that. We know that Democrats want to do that. We know that Democrats are strong advocates for public education and more affordable college education. Um, we know that Democrats are in favor of things that will make your day-to-day -day life easier and at the end of the day we focus on those issues rather than the 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 very stringent ideological beliefs that that seem to divide us from your experience uh, door knocking and mm -hmm. campaigning uh, do you do you have a sense that people who um, a lot of the voters are more interested in the cultural divisive issues rather than some of the kind of bread and butter of the uh, fundamental issues so Honestly, when I'm talking to Democrats, um, people are just really excited that there's a Democrat running. So for them, it's an easy sell. They know I'm a Democrat. They know that I'm going to vote the way that they want to vote, and they're excited to support me. They didn't have a candidate for a lot of time. Yeah, they, they haven't had a candidate. They haven't had a serious candidate in a very long time. And so for Republicans or for more moderate people, people that maybe don't have a party affiliation, um, I, what I always start with is who I am, right? I am born and raised in the South. I've lived here in Gwinnett County for almost 20 years. I went to high school down the road. I went to college where they probably went to college. And if we can connect on those issues, it's an easier sell to then talk about those issues. People want to know that I have the experience and that I have the same you know, family background and I have the strong, same values that they want, that they have. Um, and then when we talk about the issues, it's not such a hard concept for them. Um, I'll tell you an example. I was talking to a woman who was listed as an independent. You know, sometimes she votes Republican, sometimes she votes Democrat. And in that one conversation, I jumped right in. Um, she was a black woman, so I assumed she was a Democrat. I assumed wrong, right? Um, I talked about public education, transportation, and healthcare, and she wasn't really sold on those things. She said, you know, I, 
I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, I, but I like to be in the middle of everything, right? So she wasn't really sold on anything. Um, and then I, you know, I said, thank you, you know, please check out my website. And then I walked away and I went to the next house. And then when I was walking away, she opened her door and she was like, oh, you didn't tell me that you went to North Gwinnett High School because she saw it on my car. And she said, you didn't tell me that you went to the University of Georgia. So then we talked about it and it turns out that her son was in my graduating class. Uh -huh. And so then she was like, yes, of course you have my vote, right? And it was just that simple connection of you went to school where my kids went to school or, you know, you went to the same university that I went to, the same university I went to. And just being able to share that personal background was what convinced her. And like I said, she didn't agree with me on all the issues, but she could connect with me personally. And, and that's really where we're making that difference. Uh, so I, w I wanted to uh, get your position on some of the mm -hmm. uh, key issues. Mm -hmm. So as far as the public tra transportation and yeah. the vote in March, are you planning to be advocating for either yes or no vote on that? Yeah, I would. I am a strong advocate for expanding MARTA to Gwinnett County, and I will definitely be a support. Uh, I will definitely be supporting the advocacy efforts around that. Uh, whether or not I get elected, you know, we'll be we'll be doing what we can to get the turnout um, to, for that special election because I I know especially for communities that don't always have resources like um, access to a car or access to um, you know being able to sit in traffic for so long. We know that it's an important thing for communities of color to have access to transit, especially in a in an economy where you have to be able to be flexible and where you go. And so I would definitely be supporting that. Well, like I said, I, I don't know the whole story. Um, I know that a lot of K Korean community members have been, um, you know, they were supportive of the statue actually being put there in the first place. And I remember the celebration around it. Um, I don't know, I can't say off the top of my head, you know, how I would feel about how I, how I would react if I was ever lobbied around that issue. Um, but I think it's important to also remember you know, I, I am a big advocate of what the community wants, and I will make sure that I'm taking into consideration what the community views and, and their experiences and making sure that um, their voices are being heard rather than, um, you know, being influenced by um, a business entity or a, a foreign government. But what's your thoughts on 27G, the renewal in Gwinnett? Yeah, I am not, um, <laughs> I am a very outspoken advocate against 287G in Gwinnett. Um, my work for the last couple of years has been against uh, policies like 287G um, and actually my opponent has been endorsed by the sheriff and has um, publicly and on her website talks about how um, she is not a proponent of, she is, she is a proponent of programs like 287G. So. Um, Brian Kemp has said if he is elected he's, he's going to try to do a mandatory 27G program yeah. in all counties yeah. of Georgia. Uh, as a state legislature, yeah. what, would you, what would your course of action be when yeah. he tries to do that? Well, we saw that already this year with SB 452. SB 452 would have been a similar statewide 287G program, and I was actually the one that led the fight against it, and we defeated it on the last day of session. Um, we won't make that. Ha we won't let that happen. Uh, it is go going to be something that the state legislature would have to work on and have to pass. And um, I know, even if I don't get elected, we will fight that till the till the bitter end. Why, why do you think uh, legislations like the English-only legislation that keep coming up, yeah. uh, even if they don't go through, they continue to yeah. pop up? What's the, uh, do you see the effect when it comes to uh, motivating conservative uh, voters? Do you yeah. actually see that as, as effective? So if you look at the history of anti-immigrant legislation in Georgia, I actually had to do this a couple of months ago. I, actually, I looked at all of the anti-immigrant legislation that has been introduced in the last 10 years, even dating back to 2004, right? So looking at where we were as a country in 2004, where we were 2006, 2008, leading up to the Obama presidency, every single year, the number of anti-immigrant bills kept increasing. It went up from 2004, 2006, 2008. It, it was a gradual increase. And then of course, 2017, 2018 have been the worst years. Now, what, we, what, I, what my theory is and what I'm starting to realize is that back then when those bills were first being introduced, it wasn't necessarily a popular thing to be anti-immigrant. It was just something that um, was a response to um, different things that were happen happening nationally. And as the Republican Party, as the conservative party started to realize that they could um, appeal to their base using that rhetoric, 
that they could um, win some voters or win some endorsements, win some influence using immigrants as a, um, as a um, you know, something against people, then they started to use that. So that's why over the last couple of years, we see it mostly in election years. If you look at um, the amount of legislation that's introduced uh, in an election year versus a non-election year, you see that. Uh, you see a jump in anti-immigrant legislation, you see a jump in um, legislation that's against uh, communities of color, against um, LGBTQ people, all in an election year because we know that the conservative people um, will support candidates that, that they think are supporting their interests. Um, and I think that's what it is. It, this was an election year. We saw SB 452 being used by Casey Cagle in his election. He talked about how he passed the strongest anti-immigrant bill and he didn't even pass it. We, we fought that until the end and we know that we won that fight, but he still used it to campaign on, even though he didn't win it. So at the end of the day, it's just saying that you've introduced something, that you've passed something um, that, that will appeal to some of their voters. And at the end of the day, we saw Casey Cagle didn't even win, but we saw Brian Kemp who went around with his deportation bus that, 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 did the, that he won. And, you know, that deportation bus scared us, scared the immigrant community, but I guess it riled up the other community members that he was looking to get his support from. So the, the, that's the Brian Kemp that you see in the TV ads and the, the Brian Kemp that you've kind of worked mm -hmm. uh, against with, mm -hmm. but you, you communicated with him a lot yes. uh, uh, yeah. the past few years. Is, is, is this the same guy in the, in the TV ad? So the, t the, the Brian Kemp that was campaigning in the primary, um, I think he's not the same Brian Kemp that we've seen in office. Um, I do think that a part of that same Brian Kemp has been part of um, him all along, but in the primary, he had to go full on Donald Trump level Brian Kemp in order to win that nomination, and that's what he did. And now he's trying to appeal like he's moderate. He's done press conferences with diverse people. He's done um, events to make sure that he's getting, um, you know, diverse communities out and showing support for different people. But we know that that's all a farce because we've seen how we've seen how he has been over the last couple of years. We've seen how he was at the primary, and people aren't going to forget what happened just four months ago. People aren't going to forget the deportation bus. Um, and I, I, I just think that if he's trying to appeal as moderate, this is not the year to do that. Maybe in a couple of years he can appeal to be moderate, but not this year. So religious freedom is going to be another hot button mm -hmm, issue. Mm -hmm. And some of the proponents and advocates for mm -hmm. the bill are saying this is going to protect the rights of mm -hmm. uh, uh, religious minorities like yeah. Muslims. Yeah. Right? So what's your response? So actually last year or two years ago, Josh McCoon, who um, was introducing the religious freedom bill, um, used a story of a Muslim woman who um, uh, her professor at Georgia State um, wouldn't let her wear her headscarf in her classroom, used that story to say why Muslims need to support religious freedom legislation. Um, well, it turns out that that woman whose story he was using had no idea that he was using his, her story, had no idea that she was using her name, and actually um, you know, sent a letter to him saying, you know, please stop using my story because I don't support this bill. Um, we know that our communities that are being discriminated against are, are not going to be supported by religious freedom legislation. I actually, I've tried to under, explain to my own community that the religious freedom legislation will only make it easier for businesses to um, deny service to customers that are not their own religion. Um, and I think people are starting to understand that within the progressive community. Um, and I think we need to do a little bit more education within um, you know, other religious minorities to help them understand that just because it says religious freedom doesn't mean it's always a good thing. But wouldn't, in effect, so, so the, 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 the anecdote, yeah. she didn't like it. Yeah. But wouldn't, in effect, the, the bill have done what uh, has said it would be. So for her, that was a public university to begin with, and so that wouldn't have applied to her anyway because religious freedom is around pu uh, private entities. Um, and so that story just had, it just had too many flaws to it to begin with. But um, it actually, you know, when people ask me if I support religious freedom, I understand what it could do. I, in theory, I understand all of the potential um, benefits that it could have for religious communities that have been persecuted against. But at the end of the day, um, the way that it has been used over the last couple of years, the way that it has divided our communities, I could not support that. You don't support the intent? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. What's your thoughts on uh, gambling? So um, that's something that is really interesting because uh, religiously, 
you know, my, my faith doesn't allow me to gamble. So, you know, I, I can't, I don't play lottery, we don't do gambling. Um, if I was to vote on that, um, you know, as um, an economic development issue, I would have to do some research, like within my own faith and trying to figure out how I could um, support a bill that would support gambling efforts. Um, I don't know. I, I, I know there's a lot of discussion around bringing more gambling industry to Georgia, and I would have to do some research because so I don't know. You probably have to get Yeah. I know it's not. It doesn't pay you <laughs> a six figure. Definitely. Yeah. So, how are you about that? So at this time, you know, I've taken an unpaid leave of absence from my job. I've taken six weeks off from work to be able to run this campaign. Um, I I really believe that this is so important, and I am willing to do that. Um, you know, three months um, not not being paid for my job, but getting the whatever salary you get paid as a state legislator, I think it's worth it because I understand um, the real impact that you can make as a state legislature, as a state legislator. Um, and like I said, I have the support of my family. Um, I, I am also getting married at the end of this year, so oh. yeah. So I, you know, I, I do have some um, some support there, uh, but I also realize that this is this is what is important at this time, and I'm willing to make some sacrifices um, in order to do that.